Hi. Today's First Chapter Friday is Soul Lanterns by Shaw Kuski, and it, this is translated from the Japanese. It's a Japanese author. So this book is a historical fiction story um, about a sort of the after World War II. Um, and during World War II, the very end, the, the way the war really ended was when the United States dropped a, a nuclear bomb on two cities in Japan. One of them is Hiroshima. And that's where this story takes place. So this book takes place 25 years after that bombing. Prologue. When the sunlight fades on August 6th, the lantern floating begins by the bridge. Lantern upon lantern of red and green paper. Once their flames are lit, they begin to glow as if they're alive. When you see them in the river, they shine their light on the dark water as well. The lanterns and souls roll along together the lights gleam. The lanterns pitch feebly, jostling, to, jostling together as they float away. Some lanterns don't manage to join the current. They bob endlessly by the riverbank. An old man in an open-collared shirt prods them with a pole. Some lanterns tip over. They continue floating away on their sides. The many colored lanterns, their lights flickering, float away to the far-off sea. Ever since she was too young to understand, Nozomi would see the lanterns off each summer with her family, and she would draw a picture in her journal for school. Her little brother, Akiyuki, would say the lanterns floating on the river looked like red and green cubes of Canton, and Nozomi, for her part, would recall an illustration from the story of Aladdin and thought they looked like the jewels he finds in the cave. Then she would bring her forehead right up to the paper and draw the night of the lantern floating ceremony. In the 25th summer since the bomb fell, Nozomi's mother knelt next to her and her brother in prayer. There were two lanterns floating away from her hands. The green one had a name written on it, but the white one did not. That summer, when Nozomi was a sixth grader, she thought it strange for the first time. Last year and the year before, and probably the years before that too, her mother had released two lanterns, a green one and a white one. The white one never had a name. Nozomi had always seen it off without thinking, but now she wondered, who's that lantern for? Nozomi's grandmother had also just gently released two lanterns. Each bore the name of a daughter. The pair of lanterns for the girls born a year apart glided onto the water's surface side by side as if holding hands. Their lights flickered, illuminating Nozomi's praying grandmother's profile and creating shadows in her deep wrinkles. On the riverbank were about as many people as there were lanterns. There were even more people behind them. People were floating lanterns on the opposite bank, too. Nozomi could see an old couple standing huddled together as they watched. Seven lanterns had just been released. Six were pale red, some almost pink, and just one in the middle, like the center of a flower, was yellow. The seven lanterns floated on the water like a fallen peach blossom and drifted away. Following the blossom came another red lantern. Nozomi felt like she had but seen the person watching it somewhere before, but their face melted into the darkness and the lantern joined the current and was swept away. As Nozomi strained her eyes to look at the river surface, someone was watching her intently. The gaze was so strong that she noticed and turned around. The woman was about Nozomi's grandmother's age. When their eyes met, the woman's widened, and she stared at Nozomi even harder. She seemed to make up her mind and came over to her. How old are you? she asked. Chapter 1, The Strange Question The way the old woman asked so pointedly, Nozomi didn't even hesitate before answering. I'm 12. The old woman shook her head and murmured something under her breath. It sounded like, that can't be. Nozomi felt shy for no real reason and lowered her eyes. When she saw the woman's worn-out shoes, she somehow felt like she had said something wrong. She looked away from her feet and added, but I only just turned. After remaining silent for a moment, the woman asked, her face tense, do you have an elder sister? When Nozomi shook her head and answered that she only had a younger brother, the woman looked disappointed. Then she started to walk away, but turned on her heel and came back. The clinging look in the old woman's eyes frightened Nozomi, but she was rooted on the spot. How old is your mother? She's 42. Upon hearing her reply, 
The woman took a hard look at Nozomi's face. Suddenly, there were tears forming in her eyes. Nozomi was startled, and the old woman apologized repeatedly, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, as she fairly fled into the darkness. Dumbfounded, Nozomi watched her go. On their way home, Nozomi's grandma was walking with some friends from the neighborhood. Her mother, walking a few paces behind them, seemed to be pondering something. Nozomi's mother had a more or less sunny personality, but when she was alone, she tended to read books and lose herself in thought. When Nozomi was little, she often felt, Mommy's not here right now. She would get impatient and whine. Now that she was older, she was capable of giving her mother some space when her mind was elsewhere, but this time she couldn't help but start a conversation. The shock of her interaction with the old woman still hadn't worn off. Ah, that was freaky. What happened, her mother inquired absentmindedly. When Nozomi told her about the strange old woman, she stopped in her tracks. Nozomi stopped too. And then she asked me, do you have an elder sister? How old is your mother? How old is your mother? Her mother simply repeated, but set off walking again at a quick clip. Hurrying to catch up with her, Nozomi commented jokingly, I must look like someone she knows, or maybe you do? Everyone said she looked just like her mother, but Nozomi wondered if that were really true. Her mother's face was slender, while hers was round. Whenever she mentioned that, though, her mother's... <clears throat> Her mother would reply, I had chubby cheeks when I was your age, and smile. But now, instead of smiling, she said in a quiet voice, there are still so many people looking for someone in Hiroshima. That was true. Nozomi sometimes saw a man catching up to someone and grabbing their arm, or a woman peering into the face of every person who passed by. The morning of the atomic bomb, more than 70,000 people were lost in an instant. Nozomi and her friends learned in their peace studies class that these people truly just vanished. The temperature at ground zero rose to over 7,000 degrees, boiling blood and melting flesh. One person's shadow was even burned into stone steps. Still, listening to her teacher, reading testimonies, seeing pictures, and visiting the Peace Memorial Museum, Nozomi had a hard time believing that something like that had really happened. Could people really vanish in an instant, leaving behind only a shadow? It was difficult to imagine. Surely everyone felt that way, which is why so many people couldn't believe that their loved ones were gone and continued looking for them for this to this day. They clung to the idea that their family members, sweethearts, and friends had survived and were still out there somewhere. That old lady must have been looking for someone too, said Nozomi. Someone who looks a lot like you. But it happened 25 years ago, right? Mid-question, Nozomi noticed her mother's face. She looked awfully pale, even though it was the kind of summer night that made you sweaty standing still. Could it be that that lady was looking for her missing daughter and it's my mom? She grew up, got married, and had a kid who looks just like mom? Maybe that's why she asked how old she was. And now my mom realized that and was wondering what to do? Nozomi pictured grandma, her grandmother on her mother's side. Maybe Grandma adopted Mom, and Mom's real mom is this lady? Nozomi loved stories, so when she read Alone in the World or The Prince and the Pauper, she often amused herself by imagining that she was really a kidnapped princess or the daughter of a rich family with no obnoxious little brother. She had never imagined her mother in any of those scenarios, but once she started daydreaming, she felt like it almost sort of made sense. No way. It can't be. I'm going on ahead, she told her mother, and raced on as fast as she could to clear the old woman's tense expression and the daydream, which was strange even for her, out of her head. Akiyuki took off right behind her. It was after Nozomi and Akiyuki arrived home that her mother and grandma got back. They went straight to the family altar and made an offering of incense and prayed. Nozomi and Akiyuki sat quietly in a respectful posture behind them. When it was Akiyuki's turn to offer incense, Nozomi was relieved to hear her, their mother chide him. Don't blow it out. Use your hand to fan it. Maybe her pale face earlier had been only in Nozomi's head. Since the beginning of August, a flame had burned continuously on the altar. It was a sign to guide the returning spirits. The altar contained the spirits' tablets of all the people who were supposed to come back, their grandpa, their dad's two younger sisters, and one more, their dad's previous wife. 
Their dad had made it back from a concentration camp years after the war ended and married again, this time to their mother, and then Nozomi and Akiyuki were born. The lanterns their grandma had released bore the names of her two daughters, Yoshiko and Kyoko. They had both still been just students. They'd fallen victim to the bomb while they were out demolishing buildings as part of student mobilization. The Green Lantern their mother had released bore the name of their dad's former wife, Kumiko. The house was about a mile and a half from the blast, but both Kumiko and their grandma had been thrown off their feet as they were working out in the fields. They both got burned from the waist down. Later they learned that it was because of the black parts of their work pants absorbed the light. Some people even got burns in the shapes of the patterns on their clothes. An acquaintance brought Yoshiko and Kyoko, who were badly burned, home in his truck. Though Nozomi's grandma and Kumiko weren't feeling well themselves, they went without sleep to care for the girls. When both daughters drew their last breaths one after the other, Nozomi's grandma became bedridden with grief. Kumiko pulled the dead sisters' bodies in an old cart to the place where people were being cremated. After that, Kumiko continued looking after her mother-in-law and managing the household, but she grew weaker and weaker, and one morning at the end of the summer, she was found cold. She must have thought she could still work. Nozomi had heard that her apron was folded neatly near her pillow, and in its pocket was a little scrap of paper. She had written a list of all the things she needed to do around the house, and of the five, only the first was crossed off. She had been raised to be sophisticated and was talented in the flower arranging art of Ikebana, but she promised her husband, Satoru, when he went to war, that she would look after the home front, and she bravely faced any challenges that came her way. She hadn't even turned 20 yet. In the picture of Kumiko on display in the altar room, she looked like a slender, delicate child. Nozomi had a hard time imagining her pulling a cart laden with two dead people. Kumiko's name had been written on the green lantern, but the other lantern Nozomi's mother released, the white one, didn't have a name. I wonder who that lantern was for. As Nozomi offered incense at the altar, the white lantern came to mind. She thought maybe it was for someone who wasn't represented on the family altar. It happened later that day. The night was breezeless and muggy. When Nozomi woke up to go to the bathroom, she noticed a ray of light spilling from the door in the altar room. She thought maybe the votive lights had just been left on, but when she peeked through the gap in the sliding screen door, her mother was sitting alone before the altar. Nozomi was about to call out to her when she realized with a start that her mother was softly crying. There was a small paper package in her hands, but by the votive lights alone, Nozomi couldn't tell what it was. She looked at her mother's face again. She was still looking down at the package and crying when she abruptly turned to face a different direction. There was an ornate rosewood cabinet to the left of the altar, and she opened one of its drawers, put the package in there, and quietly closed it again. Then she turned back to the altar and brought her hands together. Nozomi tiptoed away and went back to her room. So I'm not going to lie, this isn't exactly a cheerful story. And although I don't generally like sad books to, for the most part, um, I, do, I do like um, historical fiction. And the reason why I think it's important to read books like this is that I think it's important to try to understand some of the world's events so that we can try to make sure um, these things don't happen again. Because so much has been written about World War II, and you can read about it from every angle, you know, I've, I've read books from, you know, the perspective of Holocaust survivors and American soldiers and people who were living in Germany and people who were living in other parts of Europe. And pretty much universally, every book that I've ever read has, has said, we need to make sure that this never happens again, because it had such a profound negative impact on the world. And so I, that's why I think it's, you know, it's sort of f fascinating and important to understand um, and to look at things from multiple perspectives like this. Um, one line I want to read you in this book that I really liked is, um, it says, luckily you kids aren't perpetrators or victims yet. If there's anything someone like me can say, it's that I want for you to live your lives without becoming either and never become a bystander. I want you to tell people about what happened during the war, 
what happened in Hiroshima. So I think that um, this is a really awesome book, just really moving and really interesting to look at um, this side of World War II coming from the Japanese perspective. So I hope you check it out.